Hi, I'm Christopher Curtis with The Link newspaper, and I'm sitting here with Amir Kadir, a member of the National Assembly for the Mercia writing. Uh, nice, to, nice to see you today. I just, I, we were thinking about this earlier, and uh, I remember seeing you at a protest uh, a few years ago now almost, and, and, and it was a protest against corruption and construction. You were, you were one of the first politicians to really call for a, uh, a public inquiry into into you know the perceived cor corruption in the construction industry and finally you know ne now we we're learning this week that uh, in fact there will be an inquiry do you have any any reaction to that well there is an officially called inquiry but uh, I think uh, it's more of a commission of uh, of interviews than a real inquiry because uh, uh, the Shahi government tailored the commission uh, suited to their need to not uh, um, you know, not bring too much attention to the real links between the Liberal Party and some sectors, some fine, uh, what we call uh, the sectorial financement of the Liberal Party. Because without the, the power of uh, constraint to bring important people to talk, uh, everybody uh, has, uh, is agreeing today, uh, experts, uh, commentators, that uh, there will be nothing more that that commission can do that the Duchenne Commission the previous commissioner that uh, was uh, preparing the field for that inquiry did. Uh, but besides that reality, there is uh, two things that must be said. First, the real inquiry is already being carried out by journalists, by very, very aggressive investigative journalism that has grown in Quebec in the last three, four years. I think of Kathleen Lévesque of Devoir, I think of uh, André Noël of La Presse, I think of uh, Alain Gravel and the in, uh, enquête, inquiry. Uh, uh, it, uh, there was a program called Inquiry in the uh, CBC French <coughs> TV and many others. <coughs> so this investigative journalism is already having, having more power and more capacity to dig the question that uh, that commission that uh, Mr. Charret announced will have. The other point is that, besides all that, the problem of corruption in our democracies is not just related to Quebec. Uh, remember what uh, Obama was talking about when he was in campaign in 2008. Uh, Obama was going into campaign with the strong idea that he's going to Washington to clean Washington from bobbies. What he meant by that is that the presence, the important presence, and control over political formations that is un actually under the hand of private sector. All sorts of private interest is by itself a corruption of democracy. So whether it is, you know, through, uh, through some uh, envelopes with money or it's through advantages given after you finish your term as a, as a, as a politician or by the power of influence and organizing pressure on, uh, as for example, the APAC, you know, the Israeli, the government of Israel and the right-wing Israeli lobby is doing in, in the United States by, you know, by, by menacing, by threatening. All those are processes of corruption of a democracy where people are elected pr in principle without to, to, uh, to base their decisions not on pressure and on advantages but on the general concept that they're there to protect the right of people and the interests of people. So the real corruption in our societies will not be addressed by any commission, that uh, fundamental type of corruption in our society will be, uh, will be addressed by real participation uh, of people in their destiny, by a more important participation of people in politics to restore the qualities that the, that the democracy must have. So obviously you think this is more more systematic than simply just the Absolutely. Liberal Party or the Parti Québécois. Look at it in, uh, in Germany, in France, Germany at a lower level, but in France in a rabid way. In the newspapers, we're talking even about, you know, uh, mallet, how do you say it, that is, um, suitcases full of money given directly to uh, responsibles of the Sarkozy campaign, the presidential campaign. We're talking, we'll look at Italy, you know, everywhere there are signs that our, our democracies are failing to private interests that try, trying to control, again, control over 
the political process by different means. Some of them are legal, some of them are blatantly illegal. Uh, the real problem is the proximity and the control of our institutions by private interest. And remind you, our political and democratic institutions are meant initially to enable people to be able to decide uh, with some distance, at least at arm distance, from those important private interests. So do you think that maybe uh, be, being a part of a smaller party, being a part of a newer party, that shields you from a lot of this? For the moment, yes. And as you mentioned it, it's because we are, for the moment, small, without a lot of influence and power, because I'm not meaning here that the left is... Uh, is um, je vais reprendre cette partie-là. À l'abri, à l'abri. Uh, sheltered. Sheltered. So, exactly, you have said the word. The, uh, the fact that we are sheltered from that is because we are small and without a lot of power. Because in reality, even left-wing government can be uh, corrupt-ridden. Um, I have a lot of uh, sympathy and uh, uh, proximity with the Lula uh, leadership and the Brazilian uh, PT government, which is in power since eight years. And they are a left-wing government, very progressive, but still they have problems of corruption. The difference with the liberal government of here is that when it's, it's pinpointed, when it is uh, you know, brought to the attention of the higher uh, level of decision, they take action, as, for example, the president Dilma Rousseff uh, did. You know, she just got, got rid of ministers, appointed a commission to do an inquiry. So that's the difference. But any power, any power is corruptible, and I would say one of the, those who who has been the most corrupt in the real sense of term was the Soviet power for years, uh, entangled in the control of bureauc bu bureaucrats, which were controlling the government apparel, government you know, uh, administration, for their uh, jobs and especially for their interests. All right, so I guess we got a little bit off topic there because we were, we were going to focus a little more on student stuff, but this is very well, interesting. This well, is very interesting this, as well. This is student stuff because the student movement is striving now to ensure a more accessible higher education. And everything, every time they go to uh, officials to ask for that, what is the answer of the officials? It's okay, it's perfect, you're right, but we don't have the means. We don't have the financial capacity. So when we are dealing about the financial capacities of the of the uh, government, well, it brings us to uh, to our attention. What about the money we are just spoiling because of this system of corruption? The decisions we take in the interest of some industrial or financial sector, which which makes the government invest huge amounts today in a very very uh, you know um, heavy infrastructure instead of. Uh, investing in public transport, in higher education, in the health sector. So the, the, uh, you know, the actual fight of the students for an accessible and quality education is also a fight against corruption because that corruption curtails the capacity of government to invest appropriately in the education sector. Great. Um, so if we look specifically at, uh, at the student movement for a second, can you... Can you tell us how you see the future of, 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 uh, for students in Quebec if, if things continue as they are? Uh, I, um, I cannot, of course, uh, predict uh, precisely, but what, from what I hear actually in the uh, student uh, agenda in the uh, fall of 2011 is that there is a, a lot of uh, uh, mobilization. Uh, I was last week in Quebec in uh, two, uh, a sea Japan university, and I felt a spirit of resistance. A spirit, maybe it was because a bit because of you know those who are gathering in front of the Montreal Stock Exchange, you know the anti uh, anti uh, Wall Street campaign. But uh, I sensed that there is a, uh, the, it, there is more of a hope within the student movement that people students will come out if they go into into strike or in, they go into uh, uh, demonstrations. Can you can you can you touch on that a little bit? I mean, the the uh, it seems as though every time uh, somebody comes out and declares the student movement dead, and there's maybe a push for higher tuition or there's a push against against student rights, mm. you know, 
lo and behold, students come back, they're alive again, you know, people, people are protesting in the streets. It's not surprising. Well, uh, in can every society, uh, the student movement, uh, even in the most uh, uh, you know, um, apathic societies, uh, the students are, are uh, the one who, who, you know, who fight first. Uh, I know that from my uh, uh, country of origin, Iran, Today we see what happens in uh, in Chile, where along you know the uh, uprising of the students for better education, for a free education. There they're not asking for a freeze of tuitions; they're asking blatantly for free education from kindergarten, you know, to uh, to the university. Uh, also in Greece or in Spain, even the protests against the decisions of government, the main organizers are not unions. For example, in in, in Greece. Okay, because unions are close to the Socialist Party, which is in power, so they're entangled in the decisions of the government. The students and the women movement at the forefront, and I hope in Quebec, the students will, uh, will realize that uh, there is a need for unity uh, between the English and French sector along that issue of economical justice. You know, access to higher education is a question of culture and civilization for our civilization to pretend that we are a civilization of knowledge. It's quite inconsistent to not invest appropriately in, our, uh, in, in that wealth. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a question of also of social justice, of economical justice, because uh, uh, we know uh, that when tuition fees are higher, uh, those who are at the bottom of the economical, uh, uh, you know, um, the pyramid. Uh, pyramid are those who are the most uh, touched by uh, and, and will be more deprived of the capacity to go to university. And, I mean, when, when, when you speak about it that way, it seems, I mean, it seems simple, it seems very clear, but when you, when you turn on the TV and you watch the news or you, 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 you tune in to, uh, to watch a session, of, uh, a session of the National Assembly, you don't often see uh, tuition and the student movement as, as being a mainstream issue. It really seems like it's a fringe issue. It's How? not. It's not. That's true. Uh, for the moment, it's not. And because, you know, one of those who, who should carry those, uh, those, uh, those issues in the National Assembly is us, Quebec City Dam. Because uh, the PQ uh, party is also more like inclined to let the government do the, you know, the dirty job because they have always been in the same logic that, you know, we have to, you know, remember those who were in power like... Uh, François Legault or um, um, uh, Landry, uh, even Marois, were opening up in the late 90s for the, uh, you know, uh, to, to bring up the tuition fees. So the ones who should carry that in National, in National Assembly is, uh, is Quebec Solidaire. But, you know, remind you, I'm the only one. I have that little time to intervene. And because of this question of the corruption in the construction industry, all these questions touching a very important issue, uh, which is taking the attention of the public, there is no more room to bring about other issues like fight against poverty and uh, fight for education, for, uh, for uh, uh, quality and accessible education. So uh, I realize that we are part of, unfortunately, that problem. Well, I, I'm, I mean, it, it's, it still seems as though even even if you speak to most people and most voters, like the, most most of the province is you know is in the in their fifties, so they haven't been students for decades now. Do you, do you mm. think that, do you think there's a there's a solution to maybe connecting people who haven't been in school for thirty years to, yeah, to the plight of people? Maybe who, yeah, well, it it might explain why it is so remote from the attention of some some uh, you know um, some officials and those who are in position of taking decisions uh, now. Uh, uh, you know, it's up to you, up to the student movement. You cannot count on those in power, even not on parties, to really uh, obtain gains. Uh, it, there will be gains if the student movement organizes and finds way to, uh, to you know, to uh, draw a platform of collaboration, of unity. Uh, every time in the last 50, 40 years where student movement has gained something is true real unity, not true government initiative, apart a very brief period in the 60s where there were, you know, progressive elements in, the, in power and, you know, in important positions of influence. So, uh, 
you know, that, that fact that uh, those in power have been uh, out of school for a long time is part of it, but the most important part of it is just the political and uh, ideological agenda that has been in power since at least 25 years, which uh, have, have brought decision makers to diminish the investment in the social net, the education net, uh, so they have diminished the investment in society in order to diminish the responsibility, the fiscal, the tax responsibility of those who are uh, rich and those who detain capital at, you know, in big corporations. In fact, those who pay taxes now are your parents and small business. So it's evident that when they address to them and they say, do you want us to bring up your, your tax to pay for for free education at the university, well, they will say no, because they're already strangled by these, uh, this, this tax burden. You were, you were speaking earlier about how there's a sort of disenfranchisement with individual political movements, maybe the system in general. Do you think that the Occupy Wall Street movement and, and you know, what's going on in Montreal and all across North America, and in a sense what's going on all across the world, do you think that in a way that's a reaction to, to the idea that you know, maybe, maybe we should move beyond party politics and this should just be about ideas? If it is, you know, if there is a, a, a promise in there, in that movement, to give reason to people to get involved in politics and change the situation in a, in a um, you know, fundamental way, as a spokesperson of an alternative party, I see no problem in that and I'm ready tomorrow to say goodbye to my party. Uh, because our reason of being, you know, our raison d'être, I, I used to, yeah, is yeah. It a, is that's it? great. Our raison d'être, in fact, Quebec Solidaire, is exactly the Occupy Wall Street movement. We are there because we were in the streets back 10 years ago, and we decided that we should do something. We are there now, we, are, we have formed Quebec Solidaire because we were at the summit of people in front of the, you know, the summit of... Uh, uh, leaders of the Americas to say, no, we need another world, no, we need a, a, another finance, we need another economy, we need another globalization, and we have to stop that capitalism. So in that sense, I have no problem with that. But I w sh should warn that if we, if we don't support parties like us, you know, if the the popular movement does not grasp the opportunity that is offered to them that um, there is a, at least one place in North America where there is a, a, a party which is, which is representing their ideals and which is uh, uh, having the same goals in them and support that. In fact, they're leaving the whole pow power and every seat in all parliaments to our adversaries. Is that a way? I don't know. If there is a better way to topple all that and bring it upside down to make space for people, I'm ready. But I don't think it's necessary to deprive all, uh, ourselves, people, from, from other means. Remind you, Malcolm X was not saying, Malcolm X, yeah, okay, yeah. was not saying get rid of uh, political parties. He was saying by all means necessary. So means Plural, you know, not singular. There are different means. There is the fight of people in streets, there is occupation, there is strike, but there is also political formations. And I hope we won't need to fight with arms one day. Do you think the, uh, the political climate in, in North America right now, and, and maybe even across the world, but the, the party politics are just about means to an end. Well, we have to win this election. We have to win this election. So we'll just do this to win the election. And, and invariably, maybe politics stop becoming about ideas and issues and they start becoming about what, how can we win? How can we... What can I say? Just watch us doing. Just watch us doing. Of course, the, the um, uh, past of a lot of parties is not very promising because there have been so often compromising. That's what you're saying. Uh, now you have to also study the roots of our organizations. Where do we come from? And I think in a large, uh, in a large extent, where we come from in Quebec Solidaire 
are quite sufficient guarantees that in the foreseeable future there's no risk for what you say. If we come to power and we remain to, into power too long and there is not popular participation or we don't find ways to uh, favor vast uh, democratic participation of people with, uh, with new means of investing in politics, yes, we will, we will end up at the same exact place in the long term. But in the short term, just watch us doing. I have just my word and that's it. But you need acts, not word. So, so many of the, uh, so many of the universities, the, the folks at the university seems to be uh, balance your budget, uh, make sure you get your financial house in order. Uh, what, what kind of problems does that present, if, if any? Of course, uh, if we want people to have confidence in what we're doing, it's evident that we cannot uh, promise that we will ruin them by getting them into a vast, a vast debt problem. Uh, but uh, I want to remind people that the problem of Quebec is not having enough, uh, enough wealth. The problem is that, is that wealth is, uh, is out of the public control. Uh, I can just pinpoint a few of them. In the last six years, between 2003 and 2010, more than $23 billion of the wealth of our soil was extracted. Of that $23 billion, the official amount, $23 billion, we just uh, touched the public, you know, the, the Quebec people in general, just saw less than 3% of that. Why? That means 97% of the profits over that $23 billion went to private interest. So we weren't in the capacity to use that to pay part of our debt. Another question. Since 2002, there is a politics in Quebec, politique nationale de l'eau, politique de redevance. So we have to have royalties of the, for the use of water by big industries. Okay? The only one paying now, apart a few private industries, is Hydro-Quebec, a, uh, a public enterprise who is paying that royalties. Every government has just, you know, put to, uh, to, you know, um, aside the need to have royalties that we touch over the use of water to diminish its, its misuse, but also to gain some, some financial capacity. Third point, in the last 10 years, PQ government and Liberal government have diminished the, um, the taxes of the most wealthy of us by $10 billion. And we have nobody like Warren Buffett in Quebec among the rich to say, hey, there is something wrong in that. Why, when we are in, in, in public debt, when we have financial problems, why shouldn't we pay our part? So this is just part of it. Another thing is that when uh, leaders of the G20, okay, of the most advanced, economically advanced countries, gathered in April 2009 after the big debacle of the economy, you know, financial crisis, a group of experts presented them a document about tax evasion. Based on their study, there is more than $80 billion of Quebec money, which is in 84 uh, tax havens or uh, jurisdictions, other jurisdictions in Quebec, $80 billion. Okay, that means that there are all $80 billion that we didn't tax appropriately. How much of it, you know, if, it, if you're at the marginal 23%, you know, the highest level in Quebec of taxation, that means that there is at least $2 billion, uh, $20 billion that evaded the, the rule that is applied to everybody, pay your taxes. So I can count that, you know, uh, with many, just remind you also that we're discussing about corruption. There are $40 billion that are meant to be spent in a time span of five years over of our infrastructures. Even if we take the most, the most conservative uh, um, estimates. estimates that there is 10% over facturation, how do you say it? Over, billing. over billing, that makes $4 billion. So when, we, when some people at the top are talking about we have problems of you know, 
uh, balancing the budget, why then they, don't they look at that side? Why are they cutting and cutting and cutting in services and uh, um, uh, increasing the burden of taxation over uh, uh, citizens? Hi, I'm Christopher Curtis, and uh, we're back here with Amir Kadir, a member of the National Assembly for the Mercier Riding. We were we were talking about some some bigger, more complicated issues. Uh, why stop now? Uh, um, do you uh, do you think that uh, Jean Chaillet will will run in the next election? I don't see how he could uh, expect to have anything to gain in doing that. Uh, I don't know. That's uh, but um, I think he he. Uh, spoiled the last opportunity he had to restore his credibility a tiny bit to be able to do that because uh, with the uh, commission that he announced he brought cynicism at its highest level and uh, people I, I think were not uh, uh, didn't buy into that so uh, but on the other hand the difficulty is that um, unfortunately we haven't seen in the English community uh, leadership coming up, speaking up, uh, those who are you know influential in the Liberal Party because you know we 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 couldn't hide ourselves that you know the Liberal Party gains a lot of its uh, power from the support you know the very cohesive support of the English community and part of the allophones, but we haven't seen uh, important leadership speaking out against this situation of corruption within the Liberal Party. Does it mean that they will continue despite all that, you know, by just closing their eyes and their nose to vote for the Liberal Party because they think there is no other way of defining politics in Quebec than through the, the axis of separatist sovereignists? And I think it's very sad for Quebec. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, those who who tend to vote the Liberal Party because of that will realize how much damage we are all causing to Quebec, refraining it from growing politically by doing so. And I don't see any possibility to really clean up and reform the Liberal Party from its practices installed by the actual direction of Jean Charest. Uh, there is no way to reform the Liberal Party without the, a true participation of the English community leadership in the English community. So I hope that that will come, come along. I mean, is that, is that the, the biggest problem with the, with the political dynamic in Quebec, that no matter how big certain other issues are, at the end of the day, people often just vote for, I, I agree with this, the separatist movement or I disagree with the yeah, separatist well, movement? Yeah, well, that is what we have seen, for example, in the municipal level. I'll remind you in 2009 when Gérald Tremblay was re-elected again. You know, who voted for Gérald Tremblay amidst all that scandals of corruption that are also touching the, the Tremblay administration. And that is very sad, and I think a big part of it is that, of course, they have a lot of money, okay? Money gained through illicit and, you know, uh, uh, immoral means, uh, corrupt means, but uh, money does not explain all. There is also that, you know, core of support, which is just given uh, blindly because they are federalists. And do you think... And I will remind them that there are other Federalist parties. There is the Green Party, okay, which could be a big uh, interesting... You know, I, I don't ask people and other means to vote for Quebec Solidaire, which is a sovereignist party, but there are other means. Or create another one, or do something, or don't go to vote. But it is important to stop maintaining this systematic corruption in power. And do you, do you think that's, I mean, a problem within the opposition uh, is that often, you know, when given a chance to really focus on a great idea, or, or a, the, the opposition, you know, is busy eating its young, like, like eat, shooting itself <laughs> in the course, foot. Or, of course, the uh, part of the responsibility is among us, among the opposition. If we talk about the municipal election of 2009, we remember how... Madame, uh, Madame Arel, uh, PQ minister, uh, instead of investing its energies in a dynamic, young, very creative party with its problems, but, all, but a, a, a party with no corruption, uh, you know, past, uh, past 
with a uh, lot of good ideas for the future of Montreal. Projet Montréal, she, she went along, you know, another group uh, close to a corrupt, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, corrupt uh, finance, um, finance, you know, money collector, yeah. uh, with La Bonté. Um, yeah, so the division of the opposition is also a problem, but all that division uh, allows this problem because of the absence of a, a proportional mode of uh, election. You will say, well, that's the, the, the situation we have. I, we say, okay, that we have a problem now, so next time we have to push for a, a more appropriate democratic voting system, which would be proportional, because this first past the post is really bad, you know, it's really encouraging a dynamic of vote which brings, you know, uh, inconsistencies and things that people don't want. But um, there is also something to do within the opposition. Actually, we're in that dynamic in Quebec, okay, in the national level in Quebec. Uh, some people in uh, Parti Québécois, some people in Green Party, and some people in my party think that we should do something to prevent Charret, and also, you know, François Legault, because François Legault is just the same, the same uh, platform. It's just different people, but it's the same agenda, it's the same ideology, the same way of thinking about politics, politics as business. And, and Legault is saying it often, that he's a businessman and he wants to run government as a business. So um, we have to do something, and there is a big responsibility within the opposition. Do you think a lot of the uh, a lot of the big issues get lost in conversations about you know Iruville or or uh, some of the the language policies that, that that are often perceived I think as as being a little bit or at least sounding a little bit xenophobic? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Uh, these these questions are important just too uh, in all of Europe and in the United States. The intense uh, the intense uh, movement and uh, and uh, immigration uh, from all parts are creating new dynamics in societies which should bring, uh, you know, bring some uh, stress, entanglement, bring some uh, questionment, and we have to address them. Of course, uh, we haven't, uh, you know, in no society, racism or xenophobia has disappeared completely. So from time to time, these pro problems erupt, and we have to address them. Uh, and there is room for those important issues, but also important economical and social and civilizational issues, like the, uh, the important question that could we maintain this productivist, consumer society? Should we continue to submit society and nature to the needs of economy, or we have to think upside down and, and adapt economy to the needs of society and within the constraints of nature? So these are important, you know, civilizational issues, because it's just only a question of right and left. Even, you know, socialist or communist could want to just progress, develop the production, okay? The question between socialist and capitalist is not production itself, is who controls production and to whose interest. But now there is another important question. Could we continue to produce and produce and grow and grow? So these are important issues. I, but these issues bring also other issues because as humanity, it's not just a question of how we eat and how we you know, produce, but also how we relate and how we define and give sense to our societies, to our, you know, our being. So these are questions of culture, of ethics, of religion, of identity, and they are as much important in my opinion. Hi, this is uh, Chris Curtis with, uh, with the Lake Newspaper. We're sitting here with Amir Kadir, a member of the National Assembly with uh, the Mercier Writing. I guess we just wanted to ask you one last question. Uh, we've spoken about a lot of issues. Uh, is, 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 there, is there a message you can, you can send to the, to the students out there who are, who are kind of hurting financially yeah. right now? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, the, the main message from Quebec Solidaire is that, you know, as a society, a lot of us, all of us have some some uh, responsibilities. We have things to, to do to maintain the gains of our society, our democracy, but also our education, uh, our economy. And depending on what we do, how much we invest, well, 
in our participation, uh, there will be more quality to our common life, to our social life, to our economy. Uh, so uh, I hope that the student uh, movement and the students in a whole will realize how important it is to define our societies, to, to, uh, you know, to project ourselves in the future geographically but also culturally, I mean in, the, in, in meaning. So in that sense, safeguarding access to a higher education of quality and also accessible uh, to all uh, is an important civilizational uh, factor in our societies. Those who don't want individuals to be critical, to be able to act and have control over their destiny, are trying to convince us that we don't have the means to become to become well educated. We don't have the means to become a bit critical about ourselves and our society. We don't have the means to gain control of our destiny. And they want us to just to be executioners, to be good at something we do, but not good at something we should have to think about. So to, to maintain that, we have to fight for it because they want to make it more inaccessible. They want to make it more differential. Those who are rich can pay the best of the education. Those who are poorer should, should be, uh, you know, should, should, should just remain where they are. So uh, the fight for education today, for a free and accessible education of quality today, is the same as the fight of Occupy the Wall Street for uh, economical justice. All right, great. So can we, can we expect to see you at a march or uh, any parties or anything like that you soon? You can expect to see me anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, in fact, it's part of my, uh, my uh, blood, uh, you know, um, my blood group. Uh, I have more difficulty def deciding to go to the National Assembly than def deciding to go to, a, to a <laughs> demonstrations. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll be there. Young at heart. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I appreciate it. Merci.